a little bit of time talking about elder law ethics. Now, we're not going to be able to cover all of the amazing and interesting intricacies that are involved in elder law ethics, but we want to give you just kind of a baseline of some things you need to think about with regard to ethical issues in dealing with the elderly. We sometimes call it the three C's of elder law or the five C's of elder law or the seven C's of elder law. Um, and so we want to talk today about the six C's of elder law. It's important to know where does an elder law attorney go to get resources on elderly issues. And we want to talk about four different places where you can find information that will help you if you have an elder law issue. First of all, we always want to remember that any ethical issue starts with our own state's rules of professional conduct. Many of the states, some 46 now, have adopted some form of the model rules of um, professional responsibility, but you want to be very careful that you are looking at your own state's rules with regard to different ethical issues. Also, you need to be aware that Almost every state in the union has ethics opinions, that is, places you can go to look at where the bar of your state has looked at specific ethical issues and has made recommendations. And finally, we always want to remember that most of the states in this country have an ethics hotline. Those are amazing, amazing resources because you can get a very quick and dirty answer on an ethical issue um, when it arises. And so you want to have that phone number um, handy in case you need some uh, real specific help. Obviously, there's case law out there. There's case law within the realm of disciplinary cases, that is, attorneys that have been disciplined for ethical violations. There are the disqualification cases. And then, of course, there are malpractice cases. So you want to consult those cases with regard to ethical issues specific to your elder law area. Um, the model rules of professional conduct are helpful, sometimes as a beginning point, but again, those are model rules and there's not going to be, they're, they're not, they have no precedential value and so you want to consult your state bar rules instead of the model rules. I would highly encourage those of you that haven't really dug into the NALA aspirational standards for the practice of elder law that you look at those. Now those are going to be updated soon and so we continue to look at how those aspirational standards can guide the elder law attorney and the attorney dealing in special needs trusts or disability law um, in a way that helps them to be more professional. So I um, recommend those to you also. And finally, it's important to understand that the ABA has a Commission on Law and Aging. And if you haven't been up on their webpage, um, you can see the site for that on the PowerPoint in front of you. You want to um, go on there and just kind of look and see the resources that the ABA provides through the Commission on Law and Aging. There's a lot of resources out there on elder law ethics. And so if you have an issue, you want to be able to go to one of those resources relatively quickly. Now let's talk about the six C's of elder law. Now, we're going to talk about the first four in this um, video, and in the second video, we'll take up the second, uh, or the f number five and number six. First, we want to talk about the client. Who is the client? And how important that is in the elder law area that we identify who that client is, and we identify what role all the rest of the people involved in the representation are going to play. We want to talk about confidences, um, confidential information and secrets. We want to talk about who is in control of the litigation. And we want to talk about conflicts. We'll take up in the next video the issues of capacity and the issues of complex re representation or representation of a fiduciary. So let's get started with clients. Who is the client? It is of paramount importance that from the very beginning of the representation, you have it clear in your mind who you are representing. There are several reasons why that's real important. First of all, you need to know who is it that you owe a duty to and therefore who can sue you for malpractice if you violate that duty. You want to be aware of whose interests you are looking towards furthering. 
Obviously, the issue of confidentiality and client attorney privilege goes hand in hand with who is the client. Whose confidences do I need to keep? Who is going to have privileged communications with me? And if I haven't identified who that is, I can run afoul of the ethics rules with regard to keeping confidences because I'm giving it to information, I'm giving information to people that aren't my client. Communications. Who do I need to be giving information to? And who do I need to be not giving information to? Who deserves to have that information so they can make an informed decision? And who doesn't have a right to that information um, because they're not my client? Conflicts of interest obviously arise when we are able to identify who is our client and who is not our client. We need to decide whether there's a conflict uh, among clients or among clients and former clients. Duty of loyalty. Who do we have a loyalty, a duty of loyalty to? Who is it that needs to be telling us what they want done and we need to make that happen? And finally, we need to be aware of the restrictions that are placed on us by the ethics rules about how we deal with non-clients. And so it's absolutely imperative that you know who's my client and who's not my client in order to understand how I deal with each one of those um, entities. It's a kind of unusual issue, if you think to yourself, um, and unique to the elder law and special needs area. Because in most areas of the law, we know who our client is, and that's not really an analysis that the attorney needs to go to, go through. If I'm a criminal lawyer, I know that my client is the criminal or the person who's been charged with a crime. If I'm in family law, I know that I represent either the mom or the dad, or I represent the husband or the wife. In a personal injury case, I know what I either represent the plaintiff or the defendant. And there's not a lot of tangential individuals, individuals that are kind of on the outskirts of the representation that are involved in the representation. Not so much with elder law. With elder law, we routinely have a group of people who are not clients but that are involved in the representation and that's why it is so important that we identify the client from the very beginning. So the question becomes how do I identify the client? Who do I, how do I know who I owe a duty to? Who I represent? Well, it's interesting because the rules that regulate the bar um, conduct, the rules of professional conduct that are in place in all 50 states do not have actual standards on how to identify the client. They come from the perspective that you know who your client is and here's the duty you owe to your client. But none of those rules go before the, the case and say, okay, but how do I identify who is that client that I owe those duties to? So the rules of professional conduct aren't particularly helpful in how we identify the client. The aspirational standards tell us that we need to identify the client, that we need to understand and identify whose interests we are being, that are being addressed, that we need to clarify who the, the attorney owns a duty to, that we need to clarify steps that can be taken, and we need to arrange for a private and direct and personal communication with the person identified as the client. But again, the aspirational standards that are currently in place do not particularly tell us, okay, but who is that person that I owe a duty to? Whose interests am I addressing? Because the truth is, sometimes I'm addressing several people's interests. Take, for example, a will. When I am writing a will for someone, I am taking care of somebody's property after they die, but I'm also looking at interests of people that are going to receive that property. And so who is my client? The beneficiary or the person I'm writing the will for? And especially if those weird situations where it's not the person, and maybe not so weird, it's not the person who I'm writing the will for that comes to my office um, originally, it is the beneficiary that comes to talk to me about a will for their mother or their dad or their husband or their wife because their loved one is in, in um, the hospital or currently not able to come into the office. So we've got to understand when that comes up, who is it that is my client? And merely the question whose interests are being addressed is not necessarily going to answer that question for the elder law attorney. Probably the thing we want to think about is not only 
who is the client from the attorney's perspective, but who is the client from other people's perspective? And so we want to ask the question, who do I think is my client? Well, I think mom is my client. Well, who does mom think is the client? Does mom think she's the sole client? Or does mom think you're representing her and her daughter who came with her? Um, the attorney needs to know, who does the client think I'm representing? And who does everyone else who's kind of involved with the representation, either because they're physically present or because they have some interest in the outcome of your services, who do they think the client is? And the most important thing is that every one of those people, the attorney, the client, and those people that are just um, involved somehow with the client need to have the same answer. The same answer needs to be for all three of those people. Who is the client? All right. So here's a few things that we want to, some questions we can ask in order to identify who the client is. Who called for the appointment? That certainly is a factor, but it's not going to be the deciding factor. But one of the things that you want to train your staff to do is to begin that information process with that person by telling them that they may not be the client, that they may need to bring their mom or their dad or their loved one in. So that you can train your staff to, from the very beginning, to say, oh, well, hello, Mr. Son, are you going to be coming in with your mother? Because your mother's going to need to come in also. Who came to the meeting? Who's present in the, in the actual interview room? And we're going to talk a few minute, in a few minutes about who should be in the interview room. Who's paying the bill? And not only who's writing out the check, but who's that check's account from? Is the account from the son? Or is the account from the mom? And does that tell us who the client is? And if it doesn't tell us who we, as the attorney, think the client is, does it tell us who possibly that person who's writing the check may think is the client? And again, we need to make sure that everybody is on the same page with regard to the identification of the client. Whose interests are being protected? Now, it's not just whose interests are being addressed, because that could be a whole bunch of people. But whose interests do the, does the attorney have a duty to protect? And that is a key question to who, in fact, we are going to be representing. And probably the final question is one of the most determinative as to who is the client. Who needs to sign the documents? I'm going to suggest to you that nine times out of ten, or probably nine and a half times out of ten, the person who needs to sign the documents should be identified as the client. We should not be making documents, unless it's a very unique situation, for someone who's not our client to take to someone else who's not our client to sign. Um, we need to be very careful about that, and the aspirational standards address that. So these are some of the factors you can use to consider who is the client. Now, if that's who the client is, mom is going to be signing the will, mom is going to be signing the health care surrogate, surrogacy, mom is going to be signing uh, the power of attorney, then who is everyone else that's involved? All right? And do I have a duty to those other, other people? I mean, do I owe any protection to those other people? Well, the first thing to consider is, are, is the attorney entering into joint representation? Meaning, I am representing two people jointly together, which means their confidences are going to be shared among the two of them and the attorney because they are jointly going forward with the completion of the services. We see this a lot of times with a husband and wife, that we can have joint representation in their estate planning, um, and we're representing both of them. The important thing for them to understand is that in a joint representation, all of the confidences need to be shared, and they need to understand that that's going to happen. Am I entering into a concurrent representation? I'm going to represent both of these people at the same time, concurrently, but separately, which means the confidences of one will not be shared with the other. 
um, that's concurrent representation. Now, with regard to both joint representation and concurrent representation, we still have to look at a conflict issue, and we're going to talk about that when we get to conflicts. But we need to identify from the very beginning of the representation, am I representing these folks jointly? Am I representing these folks concurrently? Or am I just representing one of them and this other person is not a subject of any representation? That's got to be done intentionally and very early on in the representation. Now, if I'm not jointly representing them and I'm not concurrently representing them, then they are what may be called non-clients. They're really strangers to the representation. And because they are strangers to the relationship, they're not part of an attorney-client relationship, we have to be very careful how we deal with those non-clients in a way that doesn't cause them to um, cause us as attorneys to violate our duties to our clients. Are the folks that come in, are they beneficiaries? Now, understand that the courts have found that beneficiaries are actually adverse parties to the person drawing up the uh, document that gives the beneficiary the interest that they're getting. So there can't be concurrent or joint representation with regard to beneficiaries and um, estate planning um, clients at the same time because they're seen to be adverse. So we need to be careful if we have beneficiaries who are present in the conversation because they in fact can cause there to be a waiver of the attorney-client privilege because they're seen to be adverse. Finally, we want to be aware of whether we have caused the person who we think is not our client to become what is called an accidental client or that they are a prospective client. Because accidental clients and prospective clients, we're going to owe a duty to. So let's talk for just a few minutes about accidental clients and prospective clients. Accidental clients are, are clients that become our client by accident. That meaning we're not thinking we're representing those folks, but because of our conduct, we have given the impression that we are representing them and they therefore have believed us to represent them and if in fact they then rely on us to their detriment, we could be facing a malpractice. The Talkstack case is probably the most, most famous case with regard to the accidental client case. It was a malpractice case actually where a woman came into an attorney to discuss a malpractice, possible malpractice suit because of some injuries her husband had sustained. And according to the attorney's perspective, he told her, um, we're not going to handle your case. I don't think you have a case. And therefore, they did not believe that they were representing her. The Mrs. Togstat, on the other hand, believed that she was being represented or believed that advice that she didn't have a case. She went forward and didn't do anything. And then after statute of limitations had run, she consulted another attorney who said, you absolutely had a case. And she went back and sued the initial law firm and received a $300,000 um, judgment against them because they had told her um, they had given her advice that she had relied on. And the court found that in looking at whether a client attorney relationship has been created, we look to the perspective of the client. That is, we're not going to look to the perspective of the attorney saying, oh, well, I sent them away and they weren't my client. We're going to look at the perspective of the client and ask this question. Would a reasonable client have believed that the attorney at that moment was representing them. When that advice was given, could a reasonable lawyer, a reasonable client, a reasonable person believe that they in fact were being represented by that attorney? And if that in fact is true, they have become your client. That is why when you have two folks in your office, one you have identified as your client and one you have identified as not your client, before you ever start that conversation with them, if that person is going to stay in that room, that person needs to understand they are not your client. And one of the things you need to be very careful about is once you've told them that, you don't begin to give them advice 
that would then make them believe that they are your client. We want to avoid accidental clients because an accidental client, that is a client, could then create for us a conflict that would allow us not to represent the person that we initially believed was our client. So we want to be careful about this idea of slipping into giving advice to those non-clients and therefore making them a client. Now we also want to talk for just a minute about prospective clients and we're going to come back to this when we talk about the conflict issue. Rule 1.18 in the model rules, and many states have already adopted this rule, um, and so you want to make sure because it's a rather new rule, but it deals specifically with what's called a prospective client. A prospective client is someone who comes into your office to discuss you representing them, but then you decide not to represent them. All right, so this is looking at it after that person has been told that they're not going to be represented by you. And the question becomes, if there becomes a second case that would be materially adverse to that prospective client, that person that came in to discuss representation with you, but then did not uh, follow through with the representation, can you represent that subsequent client against this prospective client? And so we have to be very careful as we are talking to people that we don't obtain what's called disqualifying information from that person prior to deciding we want to represent them. Disqualifying information is any information that could be used materially adverse to them in a subsequent case. And so we want to be very careful that the information we receive prior to deciding to take that case is not information that's going to disqualify us in future litigation or future representation. All right, so all those folks that are out there involved with the case that are not clients, we want to intentionally identify for ourselves what, are, what have I done with regard to those people to, to dissuade them of any idea that they are my client and have I been careful not to get disqualifying information from those people that would then cause me to be conflicted off of the case that I want to currently represent my client on. Who is the client is a very, very important topic that as you know if you've spent any time in elder law at all is always the first question that we want to consider when looking at ethics. Now let's move to the next C, and that's confidentiality. Now we know from law school on forward, from the oath that we all took when we became lawyers, that confidentiality is a core value of the profession. That confidentiality encourages frank communication and complete information between the attorney and the client. And without that idea of confidentiality, without the client knowing that he can tell his attorney things that no one else will have access to, we would not be able to operate as attorneys. It's an important concept throughout the legal profession. It's really based on the agency principle. The idea that when a client comes to see a lawyer, there is an agency relationship that has been formed. And that agency principle or that agency relationship is based on the fact that attorneys have superior knowledge and skill in the area of legal uh, representation. And so somebody who needs legal representation has to have a relationship with somebody who has that increased or superior knowledge. But that principle, that client, has to trust the agent enough that information that they are going to give that agent, the agent is not going to use against the client to harm them. So what is confidential information? Well, I want to use Rule 1.6 from the model rules, but again, the, the rule with regard to 1.6 varies across the United States. So you want to be familiar with your own confidentiality rule as you think about this. But Rule 1.6 says all information relating to the representation is confidential. Whether that information was gained before, during, or after the representation, if the information relates to the representation, it's confidential. 
and you are prohibited from disclosure of that information regardless of whether that information would be harmful or not. All right, there is a prohibition against divulging confidential information regardless of whether you think that would harm the client or not. We all understand that and it all makes sense to us from a very kind of um, textbook idea. But we've all been in situations where suddenly we find ourselves trying to figure out whether we have in fact divulged information that was confidential um, unintentionally. We need to understand that under the current rules of professional conduct, the lawyer is prohibited from disclosure regardless of the intent. There does not need to be intent on the part of the lawyer in order to violate that rule. There doesn't even have to be knowingly disclosure. Any disclosure, regardless of the mental state of the lawyer, violates this rule. That's why we have to be very careful about wayward emails, wayward texts, wayward information that leaks out of our office with regard to our clients unintentionally by us, but still in violation of the confidentiality rules. We need to be aware that social, professional, domestic, any of those relationships where we share information about our clients, we have to be very careful that we're not violating confidentiality. And we need to remember that confidentiality survives the end of the representation and even to, it, it survives even to after death, which is very important from the elder law perspective because you need to be very careful that the person you're divulging information to after your client has died is entitled to that information because not everybody is. For example, the beneficiaries in many states are not considered to be entitled to the confidential information you have um, after the client dies. Um, and so you want to be very familiar with who can I give information to after the client has died or who can I give information to while the client is still alive um, when family members are interested and we need to understand not every family member is out to uh, do wrong things with regard to the information they receive about the client but that doesn't mean that the client's information is not still confidential just because you think it would be helpful for someone to know confidential information about your client does not mean that you have the right to give that information. I like to think about confidentiality being something that is loaned to me. Confidential information is not my information to decide where it goes. It belongs to my client. It's information that belongs to my client and I don't have a right to give that information that belongs to someone else um, to other people without that person's consent. Information is confidential even if it is publicly known. So we need to be careful that, well, everybody knows this or that about this person. It doesn't matter. It's still confidential information and you still have a duty not to discuss that information. The courts have found that legal knowledge and research are not considered to be confidential unless they would, the divulging of that information with regard to specific research would reasonably likely lead to the discovery of protected information or information about your client. Comment 4 to the model rule 1.6 says that you can do hypotheticals but again those hypotheticals that you use in teaching, um, in presentations, um, in discussing a case with someone else cannot give so many facts that they are li reasonably likely to identify the client. So you want to be very careful that confidential information, even the identity of your client, is confidential. It may not be attorney-client privilege in some situations, but it is confidential. So you want to be very careful that you don't use hypotheticals, especially if you're teaching in a small jurisdiction where everybody kind of knows everybody else, that you don't give up facts that are going to reasonably likely um, lead to the identification of the client. Our NALA aspirational standards um, specifically say that we have to be very careful to explain the obligations of confidentiality as early as possible to everybody involved. You know, the daughter or the son need to understand 
Your mom's estate planning is confidential and I will not divulge that information to you. Um, so that they understand what information they're going to get. Now, we're going to talk in just a minute about whether the client can waive that, and they obviously can, but we need to understand that in the absence of a waiver, son, daughter, person who pays the bill are not entitled to that information. And the NALA standards say we need to be very careful that everybody understands that. We need to be very intentional about strictly adhering to the obligations we have to the client. We need to be very careful if we're having frequent phone calls with family members that we're clear with regard to what information the client has impliedly author or informed consent, has given us informed consent to give that information and what family members and what information the client has not given us informed consent to give to that. It's possible that the client may pick and choose what members of their family they are going to give information to. And the only way to find out is to communicate, communicate, communicate. You have to talk to that client and find out specifically who they want that information to go to. That comes to the issue of 1.6 exceptions, informed consent. Understand that if in fact we think our client wants information to be divulged to different people, we need to get that client's informed consent. Not just kind of a casual, oh, okay, I'll tell your daughter about it, but explaining to the client the benefits of sharing information to other people, the risks of that, and the alternatives. Um, the client needs to understand, even if they would never believe their son or daughter would ever do anything to hurt them, the attorney has a responsibility to get an informed consent if in fact he or she is going to divulge that information to anybody other than the client. And I think we fall short many times in having that very thorough discussion to get informed consent to reveal information. There are several other exceptions in 1.6b that we want to be aware of um, to prevent reasonably certain death or substantial bodily harm. Then we are allowed to give over information. Um, if our client is going to commit a crime or a fraud that is reasonably certain to cause financial um, interest or injury to a financial interest and that client has used our lawyer's services. Now that's the key. We're going to talk about this a little bit when we talk about fiduciary representation. But if my services as an attorney have not been utilized to commit the crime or the fraud, then I am not under this exception and therefore I can't divulge the information. Now there may be other reasons why I can divulge the information, including if in fact the information has been given to the court, but we need to be very careful that we have to come under an exception in order to divulge confidential information even when we are representing a fiduciary. To prevent or mitigate um, substantial injury to finances, again, if there was the use of the legal services on the part of the lawyer, to obtain legal advice, or in those situations where we are being sued or we are facing discipline with regard to a case, then we may respond to allegations or use that information to forward our claim to the extent necessary for that purpose. And finally, if it's necessary to comply with the rules of professional conduct. You want to read over the exceptions in your own state bar to see what those exceptions are and not to believe that basically, oh, well, my client is about to commit a fraud. I get to divulge that information. Not necessarily because at least under the model rules, you have to have the additional requirement that in fact the lawyer's services have been used for that crime or fraud. Let's now talk about conflicts, all right? We've talked about who's the client. We've talked about that confidentiality issue, and I encourage you to go back and reread your rules with the idea of elder law representation in your head. Let's talk for just a second about conflict issues. Conflict issues are best analyzed under the Model Rule 1.7, Comment 2. And a lot of states have this Comment 2, and I encourage you to read it because it is a very helpful step-by-step -step, uh, analysis of conflicts. 
The first question under comment two is, who is the client and what is the nature of the relationship? Is this person my client? And the other person that I'm concerned about is a non-client. Am I concerned about a former client who might in fact be um, injured by me going forward with this case? Is the person that could be injured by this a prospective client? And so the first part of the conflict rule is to go back again and identify who are the people that I am going to be representing and who are the people I'm going to be representing the client against? And what are my relationships to those people um, with regard to whether they were clients or not? Were they former clients? Were they prospective clients? Um, did the son come in and talk to me and I took his mom as the um, client and now the son wants to do something against his mom? You know, what relationship did I have with the son? What relationship did I end up having with the mom? So the first question is to again identify those natures of those relationships. Number two, is there a conflict? And the different rules define conflicts differently. For example, model rule 1.7 defines the conflict occurring if the concurrent client, ha if you have two concurrent clients who are directly adverse to each other then you will have a conflict. If one of your clients um, is going to cause you to be materially limited in how you can represent another client, then that is a conflict under 1.7. All right, so 1.7 looks at concurrent clients, clients that are you're representing concurrently. Is there a conflict against one of those concurrent clients? And you determine that by whether there is a direct adversity or whether you are materially limited. If it is a former client that you are now going to be suing, then conflict is defined by is the case that you are now taking materially adverse to that former client in the same or substantially the same issues. All right. And so you need to define, okay, is this case that I'm taking now against this client that I had formerly, is this going to be materially adverse to that client? And if it's going to be materially adverse, is it the same as what I represented that former client on? And finally, that's under rule 1.9, former client conflicts. And then as we discussed um, previously, with regard to prospective clients, did I obtain information that could be materially adverse to this prospective client as I go forward with this current client. Can I represent this person because against this prospective client, this person that came in to interview me, or did I receive information from that prospective client that makes their, that creates a prospective client conflict under 1.18, which will prohibit me from representing this current client against the prospective client? Now, once I've defined if there's a conflict or not, I'm not done because all of the rules allow for certain conflicts to be waived or to be consented to. And so the third question in the analysis, is this a conflict that can be consented to? Now, understand that with regard to former client conflicts under 1.9 and prospective client conflicts under 1.18, those are always waivable. They're always consentable. If I can get an informed consent from my former client or from my prospective client, I can always go forward. But with regard to concurrent clients, where one concurrent client is getting, uh, is either directly adverse to another concurrent client or the concurrent client has a conflict because I, they're materially limited in what I can do for them because of this other client, then the attorney needs to ask themselves this question. Do I reasonably believe that I can represent that current client effectively even though there is a conflict? And it's a reasonable standard. So would a reasonable lawyer believe that they could represent this concurrent client and this concurrent client at the same time and give them both effective representation? And if not, then they can't request a consent from that client. And finally, if it is consentable, then did they obtain an informed consent? And you can see I capitalized the word informed because it's not just a consent. 
It's a consent that requires you to go through all of the advantages and all of the risks of that concurrent representation. If that concurrent representation is joint representation, you're going to need to again get informed consent because you need to understand in joint representation, it may appear that you can do equal things with them, but it could come a time where you can't represent both of those clients and they need to understand that before they consent to that joint representation. Lots of very interesting issues with regard to conflicts in the elder law area. I've hopefully given you just a taste of it, but you want to again go back, review those state rules you have with regard to conflicts. Concurrent representation, former representation, and prospective client conflicts. Finally, let's talk about control. Who is in control of the litigation? Who's in control of the representation? Well, Rule 1.2 in the model rules and in most of the state rules say that the client is in charge of the objectives, but the attorney must consult and make the decisions as to the means. What that means is you have to have a conversation with your client about what their objectives are. What is the client's objectives with regard to Medicaid planning? What do they want to preserve why do they want to preserve it? What are they trying to accomplish with their representation? And what's important is that you don't assume objectives merely because someone comes in and says, well, I think I might want to, you know, give some, give some assets away to my kids so that, you know, I can qualify for Medicaid. Well, you need to have a further conversation with them. What is their real objective in giving that away? Is it to save money? to hopefully make sure that they are taken care of in their old age? Um, or is it merely to give, the, give all the assets away to the kids? There needs to be a conversation so that you understand what the objective of your client is under Rule 1.2. The aspirational standards point out this, that in the typical case, the client's chosen course of action is going to appear totally logical, appropriate, the right thing to do. Sometimes, however, clients are going to make decisions that appear to not be really in the client's best interest. And normally, in the absence of diminished capacity, which we're going to talk about in the next video, normally the attorney is bound by the decision of the client regarding the objectives of that representation. Now, that doesn't mean you're not going to advise them of all the problems and all of the issues and how that could implica implicate all kinds of legal and non-legal issues because Rule 2.1 of the model rules say we can advise clients on moral issues, social issues, financial issues. We can go the whole gamut and we should be talking to our clients about that. But in the end, in the absence of some sort of need for protective action, the client's objectives need to be followed through with, even if we don't necessarily think they are in the client's best interest. I always say it this way, just because you're gray-headed does not mean you don't have the right to make stupid decisions. We all have the right to make stupid decisions, and that includes elderly people. That brings us to the end of this lecture. Hopefully it's given you kind of a taste of all of the interesting issues with regard to elder law and ethics. And we'll pick up this uh, same um, issues when we talk about capacity and complex litigation in the next video.